Welcome everyone. This is Fireside Chat with Debbie Marks and we have Debbie with us. Hi Debbie. And we also Hello. have Sally today. And we're going to hear a little bit about Debbie's story. So Debbie, I know your story starts off with once upon a time is where my story begins. Tell us about that. Well, I wanted to start at the beginning and what better place than to uh, let everybody know that in uh, 1953, I was born. I was a Navy brat. My, uh, I was born in uh, Seaside Memorial Hospital in Long Beach, California. And uh, my mom, Esther, was actually the first born of an army captain. And, uh, and his wife, <clears throat> my grandmother, they were born in 1934. My dad, Richard, was the second son of, in his family, and they happened to be living in uh, California at the same time I was born. Um, <clears throat> my dad uh, was a Navy seaman and he worked with the electrical uh, uh, components of battleships. And um, my mom, when she graduated from high school, uh, she, they moved got married in New York and they moved to California so he could finish his uh, four years in the Navy. So, I mean, really, um, you know, you never think about being a Navy brat. I mean, I never did really. And um, when I went back once to California, I purposely went to Long Beach because I wanted to see the hospital that I was born in. And, and I realized how close it was to the ocean. And that's probably what has given me the passion I love for ocean, being wow. near the ocean is that. <laughs> Debbie, this is stuff I never knew about you. So what, what a great backstory. I love that. I love that. Um, I, I remember, um, you know, just a, a tad bit, it is kind of important to kind of revisit some of those places. Um, I was actually born at, here in Columbus, Ohio at the old St. Anne's, if anybody remembers where that was on Bryden oh. Avenue. And my daughter, Jennifer, was also born at the old St. Anne's the last month they were open before they built their new hospital up in Westerville. So it's kind of fun to go look at that building now um, to just know that's where I was born. That's where, you know, I entered into this world and it's where my Jennifer entered into this world. So it is, it is a, a cool thing to kind of revisit those, those places. Mm -hmm. So at some point though, you returned back to New York. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I remember the stories that um, my mom always told me about. They actually took a train ride from California to <laughs> uh, New York. So you can imagine back then what that was like. And um, in the course of moving, moving back, I was still um, a young child of, of two. And um, my dad, uh, with his electrical background, uh, my, my grandfather, who also worked at Scott Aviation in, in actually Lancaster, New York, got my father a job there. And if you're not familiar with uh, what uh, Scott Air Pack is or Scott Aviation, it's where they um, uh, construct the uh, uh, air tanks and face masks that the firemen use uh -huh. when they're fire fighting fires, chemical fires, whatever. So I have to tell you, every time I see something like that in the news, I always look to see what, <laughs> what's on their air tanks. <laughs> But um, he worked there um, many years. And uh, in fact, I remember the article of my grandfather when he retired. It was so awesome. In fact, I've put that in my uh, genealogy, his um, article from Scott Aviation for that. Um, and um, I soon became uh, the oldest sibling of five. I had two sisters and I have two brothers. Okay. And, uh, um, but we were a family that lived in a very, very low income environment. 
we had a lot of challenges and, but um, you had to be creative. Like sometimes a situation would come up and you, you had to, you know, I could probably say back then my mom th thought outside the box. Um, and uh, so, but today I have to admit that I'm very, very grateful for my mom. Um, she, she taught me so much um, in my younger years that um, I'm using these days. And, uh, you know, at the time when I was learning these, I thought, oh, what am I going to do with all this stuff later on? But, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and a lot of us think that. Um, but if it wasn't for her teaching me how to cook, I wouldn't feel free to experiment these days and the gardening well you know that's when I got my first taste of learning to garden and and but most importantly was watching and helping her can everything mm -hmm. I mean she did everything from tomatoes to pickles to vegetables but back then everything was canned nothing was frozen and well, um, they didn't have the freezers like we have today either no, yeah no, I get that that's yeah. for sure that's for sure. And, um, but like I said, 47 years of marriage now has really uh, been a benefit at that those things that I grew up learning. Wow, I get it. I, I remember watching my mom do all kinds of things. Now, of course, my mom worked at a factory job and minimum wage, and she worked a lot of overtime. And so she taught me at a very early age how to take care of the house kind of a streamlined system and I use that still today yeah. so uh, yeah and we don't realize maybe what we're learning back then but it does mm -hmm. it does benefit us later on now you and yeah. I were talking one time and you said that as a child you were living two lives can you tell us about that Debbie well <clears throat> this is probably the the darkest secret um as I stated before, I was the oldest of five. And um, I had a lot of responsibilities in taking care of them um, because my father would, you know, request that she attend things with him. So I was always babysitting. I mean, I learned right from the beginning how to take care of an infant. Um, and uh, then I realized and I learned that I had to protect them and I, and, and I had to protect them from my dad. Oh, wow. And, you know, people will look at you and say, why? I mean, he's your, he's your dad. I mean, what's so wrong with that? Well, um, basically short and to the point, he was a strong very strong alcoholic who was uncontrollable at times. Oh, wow, Debbie, I had no idea. There was once where he was so mad because I let my sister do something that, and it was simply, she chose to ro ride a, a bike double with a friend and she fell off and she got hurt. So consequently, it was my fault. And with that, um, uh, my dad got so angry, he actually took my head and was hoping to pound some sense into me. Um, but all he basically did was put put a hole in the wall. And I will never forget that. I can visualize the wallpaper. And um, in addition to that, you know, he had a mouth like a sewer and he was abusive in every sense of the word. And for me, um, I was always getting beating, beatings with uh, a belt. Uh, I remember one time where I was 12 and I evidently did something wrong and I don't remember what it was, but um, he had a belt and the belt was used uh, quite vigorously all over. And it didn't matter whether I had a shirt on or pants on or whatever. It's that's what it was. 
And um, my mom could do nothing to stop. And so um, I took the, took this abuse to, to protect my, my siblings, but I found that even with everything I had within me, it, um, he succeeded in. Oh, Debbie, I had no idea. I had no idea that, that it's okay. Went through all of that. I am so sorry for those of us that have, have had a different type of childhood. My, my dad was a very kind and, and loving and passive kind of personality. Um, I can only remember my entire childhood of him even raising his voice twice in my entire childhood. And even then he never was physically abusive in any way. Um, he just, he yelled at us twice. And I remember it crushed me because I thought I had disappointed him. <laughs> and that's you know, easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I cannot even imagine as a child, how you navigate the emotions that go with, this is your dad, who on one hand, from your earlier story, you're very proud of. And mm -hmm the legacy that he created, but then on the other hand, have to uh, navigate toward the emotions and, and, and where you put that mentally, you know, how you, how you um, can, can navigate through all that. That is just amazing to me. And I can't even relate to that because I've never had to. Well, <clears throat> um, through much therapy, I was going through thinking that it all started when I was five years old. But in therapy, I found out that I was actually three years old when all of this started. And it actually lasted for 13 years. Oh. And, um, you know, when you, when it, when you put a, a time on it, you sit there and you go, oh, that, that's my entire childhood. Mm -hmm. entire childhood and um and then well, and, an, you know, and another thing too debbie when you look at a three-year-old when you yeah. look today at a three-year-old and you tell yourself that's how big i was that just breaks my heart yeah it, and, and you're right i i i can honestly say that a couple of times i've related to that um, and I, I can't imagine them, uh, having to go through the same thing because no child should ever have to deal with the situations that I had to deal with. And, and I, it was very hard for my mom when she found out very hard mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, to this day, I can remember what her and I were doing when she came right out and asked me. And, you know, I gulped and, and I had to admit it. I had to say yes. And, you know, from, from then on, it was hell in the house because I exposed mm -hmm. and, um, and I put up with that. Uh, for another uh, four years and uh, when I was had graduated from high school and I just um, just graduated and um, he couldn't handle it anymore so um, he kicked me out so I had to uh, deal with living on my own my mom had she could say nothing in fact when she came home um <laughs> She asked where I was, and my dad said, uh, I kicked her out. <laughs> you know, you can imagine the look on her face. And well, and now it's a double-sided sword for you as well, because not only are you having to try to support yourself and figure out where am I going to stay, how am I going to feed myself, how, how's my life right. going to look, you're leaving those siblings behind. Right. Oh, that was oh. the hard part. <laughs> yes. So, um, so Yeah. Yes, that's, that's the secret life that I led. Wow. And, and, and in a way, I have kept it a secret all these years. I mean, 
You just don't go around talking about that. Back then, you didn't go to the police and complain because they would say it was your fault. What did you do wrong? You know, and um, they, they, you know, and then now it's, I couldn't even imagine what's going on now for a lot of these people. But anyways. I, I felt bad about the people during, you know, lockdown when you couldn't go anywhere and the kids and the women who were in, in abusive households were trapped. What did they do? They're trapped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it couldn't have gotten better, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. If anything, yeah. it got worse and it was never talked about. I mean, yeah. yes, once in a while it would be brought up in a very deep conversation about you know, who is, is this lockdown is affecting, but nobody ever, no, nobody ever looked into it. Nobody expanded on that. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in the general news media at all. It was, no. yeah. If you were in certain circles, the subject may have come up, but it, it wasn't just general conversation on how can we mm-hmm. protect these, these folks. Right. Right. Because everything was shut down in any form of support. Mm-hmm. It, exactly. It was gone. Exactly. Wow. Wow. But then Rick came into your life. Tell us about that, Debbie. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember back in, we met in high school, the last, our senior year. And my friend Cheryl said, hey, Debbie, come and play, play Euchre with us. We always played Euchre at lunchtime. And I go, well, I don't know how to play. She goes, that's okay. We'll teach you. So that's how I met Rick. Okay. I was at the euchre table with him and we were all playing and it was it was great fun and um so we graduated together and um he was the love of my life uh you know we we spent all of our free time together and we had so many college or high school friends and um yeah but you know you know how it goes, summertime ends and um, he had to go away to college and that was okay. You know, I was figuring my life out because I had been kicked out already. And anyways, you know, um, I decided after, you know, finding a good job, trying to work, I uh, decided, you know what? Someone said to me, go back to school. You're living on your own. You're not making money to, to pay for college. Go back to college, go to college. And so I, I applied and I got most of my college paid for. So, which was good. And um, Rick and I talked it over and we decided I would apply to the college that he was going to. And I was accepted. And so it was great. I mean, we went to school together, we did homework together. And um, <clears throat> I went, I was going for a business degree, and he was expanding his um, uh, electrical engineering uh, degree. And uh, um, so it was, it was fun. I mean, it was interesting. And um, but my dad was not appreciative of it at all. <laughs> he well, unfortunately still played, you know, tried to interfere. But that's another story. <laughs> well, and again, somebody that's abusive, oftentimes it's about power. It's about control. And, and my guess is he felt like he had totally lost control of you since you were out on your own. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. So, so you guys got married. You and Rick got married. Yes. Okay. Now, were you still in college, or were you both graduated by then? No, we were actually still in college. Okay. We, okay. We, got in co- we were still in college. We were just finishing up um, the last year. Okay. And um, I will admit, um, I got pregnant. 
what else? <laughs> it's, it's not unusual. Well, so, Debbie, let me just say you're not the first and you won't be the last. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so it was, you know, no big deal. I mean, so what? We were going to get married anyways. We were already engaged. So um, we decided we got married um, in January of 1974. Really, a long time ago. Um, but um, we planned it all out. We paid for it. I mean, that was bare minimum wedding. I mean, my dress only cost $30. <laughs> yep. Which was a lot of money back then. Back then, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And um, uh, we told, I told my mom, or we, Rick and I told her together, and she said, you know, I can't, I can't come. I don't want your dad to know because it'll just be problems. And um, which really it did turn out. Um, we were, Rick and I had our college friends around us. Rick's mom did attend and her best friend. So it was just nice and, and, and fun being with just our friends. And um, <laughs> the next day, my, my minister, unbeknownst to my mother, announced that Rick and I had gotten married. And of course, everybody in the congregation was congratulating them and blah, blah, blah. And my, of course, my dad is standing there going, what the hell? Excuse me. <laughs> and, um, and But of course, and was, he had to save face in front of all the church people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course. And I remember my mom calling me and say, and told me, she goes, your dad's on his way to find you. And well. What did that mean? That. Um, that was, I got the word out. Hey, somebody's coming to look for me. You have no idea where I am. And that worked because he never could find me. And he went back home very defeated. And, but, and I'm glad because I, that was my special day. And I didn't want him ruining it. I get I that. Mean, I mean, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. I understand. So, yes. Okay. So then fast forward. So now you already have the one child and now you have a second child. Yes. Yes. Um, Sandy was born in uh, 1977. And um, for some reason, but I know now that it was God's hand was I decided to go get Sandy baptized two weeks after she was born. Okay. And so, because we went back home by then, my father and I were at least talking and um, I wanted to get her baptized. I wanted my parents to see Sandy and have my pastor do it. And, and of course you, you already had Lori. Right. Lori, okay. Lori was um, born earlier in 74, actually. And um, so the first thing my dad said was when he saw Sandy was, boy, that's scary. Because Sandy was 24 inches long and weighed 11, 11 pounds, 14 ounces. So oh my goodness, Debbie. <laughs> that would be scary <laughs> for anybody. <laughs> but um, it, was, it turned out to be a good thing because my fat father... Um, passed away two weeks later from a massive cerebral hemorrhage oh at the age of 43. That's and all, just, that's just how old he was. That's all. Yes. 43. Wow. Yep. But oh, Debbie, that's about how, I'm sorry. What, that's, ahead, Sally. that's about how old Ed's father was when he died, but he died of lymphoma. Wow. That's so young. Well, and the older we get, the younger it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But exactly. Debbie, you, you had to have so many mixed feelings during that time. I cannot even imagine navigating all of those emotions and, and coming out sane at the other end. <laughs> you're, you're so amazing. It, well, and, and the thing about it was when he passed away, um, 
I had my four siblings to take care of. They, you know, my youngest brother was only nine. Oh, and wow. I had taken care of him from the time he came home from the hospital. That's another story. Um, but um, they needed my strength. They needed me to be strong for them and my mom. And, um, uh, but the thing was, I hadn't forgiven him. Yes, I, I, put I, a, I wrote a letter and I put it in the coffin. And, um, and what I realized was that's the day that I stopped crying. It, it, it sounds strange, but I stopped. I stopped crying because it, it, it's just what was inside of me that I couldn't explain. Well, at that missing. point, you, you did all that you could do. You, you know, you, you, yeah. you did the best you could with the information you had through growing up. And now you've put that letter in his coffin. And, it, and I, my guess is, is that you kind of gave yourself permission to let that go. I thought I was. Okay. <laughs> that okay. was the intent of the letter to, to, you know, move on. But I soon found that uh, you know, that didn't happen. So, okay. All right. So, so tell us about that. 2000 was nearing. So now what it's been 26 years. You now have a family of five. What happened then? <laughs> well, I, we all can relate to having teenagers in your life and oh, you, yeah. you, <laughs> it just, get up in the morning and say, okay, let's, what's today? Hang on. <laughs> and, and let's, let's go. And, um, uh, my life was so busy. I, I, I couldn't see straight. And, but, but the point was that, um, I thought I could handle so mm -hmm. much more so you know um like i mentioned uh we were living in a great neighborhood but i soon came to be the um go-to ah. oh debbie can do it and i would say sure no problem um i took on the neighborhood kids before school and after school for two years and meanwhile, Rick is working and he actually went back to get his master's and um, I was just kind of sitting there left hanging, old in the bag. And I'm sure that there's a lot of women that are listening to this later on mm -hmm. that can relate to. Them. Oh, yeah. So um, um, I ended up, my health went to pot for... Um, and I came down with uh, some severe, severe migraines that eventually put me in the hospital for some time being. Oh, wow. And, but when I came out, I said, okay, now what? Because I wasn't going to go back to babysitting <laughs> at all. That was enough, you know, two years, two, and, and I actually had 12 kids. So oh, my goodness, Debbie. You I had a house <laughs> But luckily, you know, it was um, some in the morning, some in the afternoon, and I only had a few during the day because they were infants and they were growing up. But, you know, I'm sure we've all had to put ourselves out there mm -hmm. and then take a step back and say, what was I thinking? <laughs> So it sounds like you came up with a plan. So let's call it plan A. What was your plan? Well, my plan A consisted of, okay, there's more out that front door that I have no knowledge of. And um, I said, you know what? I'm going to put my talent to work and I'm going to go find a job. And then I realized, oh my God, it's been 19 years since I actually worked out, worked in the, in the, out, worked out of the, you know, in the, the home, business right. world. And it was like, do I really want to do this? But I did. And 
um, because I'm so was so much into crafting and sewing and everything. Um, I got a part time. I just went out. I got a part time job at a place called Peace Goods. Yeah, that, that used to be in Lancaster. Not anymore. I remember and, it. Though. I remember it. <laughs> and um, it was fun. I enjoyed it. But I realized my freedom came at a price because, a uh, big price, uh, because uh, I had to be super mom because I not only had to work, but I had to make sure everything, mother duties, wifey duties were, were all taken care of before I went to work. Because when I got home, I would have the aftermath to pick up after. So. So, so your, your, your job at home didn't change. You just added to it. <laughs> How true. How true. <laughs> okay. So then you decided if, if you couldn't keep up that super mom status. So now you're going to move on to plan B. What was your plan B? Well, my plan B consisted of not working for corporates anymore. I was sick of that scene. Um, after Peace Goods, I worked at Joanne Fabrics in different okay. positions, you know, and I expanded my knowledge of, of business. And um, I said, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to open up my own business. And so I opened up Prairie Rose Quilting House in Lancaster. And um, I loved it. It was the freedom. Um, my mom had come to live with us. So she would come to work with me. I taught her how to quilt and she just, she just went head, head into it. And, um, but uh, I, I, we had, we, we had such a good time that one time in particular, we went on a buying trip and we went to Kentucky. Because in Kentucky, there's Paducah, which is the national quilt show area. Wow. Um, every year. And I, Sally, by the way, I would love to go back there. <laughs> um, you know, Elkins is a big quilt, quilting oh. place, too. Elkins, West Virginia. Big. Okay, well, no. let's go there. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. So anyways, um, my mom and I were walking through uh, Paducah Mall. And these beautiful quilts were on display. And we met um, the person who um, had written the book, but she was also the creator of the quilts that they used in the movie, How to Make an American Quilt. Her name was Patty McCormick. And through conversations and just hitting it off, she agreed to come to my quilting shop in downtown Lancaster for the art festival. <laughs> she came for the art walk when the Lancaster festival was going on. She brought the quilts and we just opened up the shop and we displayed the quilts and she signed her books and, and gave them to whoever came. And the one picture that I, we took that night I have such great memories because if you've seen the movie she took the quilt and she wrapped it around herself and then she wrapped it around her and her fiance and for for um for for family and so my girls all four three of them excuse me three wrapped themselves up in this quilt and I took a picture Aww. and so to this day, I have this great little photo album of all the pictures we took during that experience. And I mean, don't get me started. I mean, I could go on. It was, it was just amazing. But unfortunately, <clears throat> plan B was coming to an end. Um, I really hoped that this experience would have um, helped boost my image in the town, create more interest and in, 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 in to come in and, and um, learn, learn and be in a comfortable place. But that didn't happen. I 
I struggled for the next two years. And I finally said, you know, in uh, December of uh, 1989, um, I closed the door. I had to. I, I had to. Strictly uh, financial reasons, though, because you oh, still yeah. loved everything about the quilting, but uh, the community just wasn't supporting the volume that you needed to keep your doors open. I get it. Right, right. Because people, yep. people have a tendency to look more at dollar or how much it costs versus the quality. Yeah. And um, that was just hard back then for them to understand that. So yep. it, I get it. It was okay. It. it was another chapter that I was closing the door. So now you have to go on to plan C. Good for you that you had a plan C. I'm not sure I have a plan C. <laughs> Well, that plan C was kind of a work in progress. Um, you know, it was like, okay, now what am my mom and I going to do? And we decided that, well, let's take our crafting to the next step. Okay. We both love to create things and sell them. And um, so we kind of worked on this. We did craft shows, but also in conjunction with that, uh, to this day, I can't imagine why I did this, but I actually made formals for wedding parties. <laughs> Yikes. Oh yeah, my that gosh. Was... So when I need a gown for my next ballroom dance, I come to you, right? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> I, you know, in the long run, it was fun because the, the end results was, oh, just so rewarding I bet um that and that uh, legacy lives on in all those pictures that those gals had with those gowns yes exactly exactly and and uh it, it, you just had to be there <laughs> I get it I get it so <laughs> Oh, but then you also played around a little bit with MLMs. What, what did you discover there? And, and for those that are listening, an MLM is a multi-level marketing company. There's hundreds of them out there. I was in Mary Kay for a long time in the salon industry. I encouraged all my stylists in my salons to take on a, an MLM because they had a ready-made audience with all of their salon customers and so they could do Mary Kay, they could do Avon, they could, you know, any one of those companies. Oh, yes. And, and they, made, they made a nice income, a nice side income, if you will, from, from their association with the MLMs. So I encourage them to, to do something different in addition to doing hair and nails. So what well, was your experience, Debbie? Well, you have to be, uh, you have to be careful. <laughs> you have right. to study a little bit and I didn't do that that was a lesson learned and but I was in you know close to 10 different MLMs and all I realized was that the person that was way above me was the one that was making all the money I was making the money for them mm -hmm. and um they never told you you had how hard you had to work, but the harder you work, the more money they made. And I just decided that, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm not going to do these anymore. And uh, it was, everything was, a, even though the companies I was with have great products, I would never degrade those at all. But it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. It was not for me. And and in the end, I realized it was the smartest move to do for my marriage. <laughs> okay. Because you were doing all these things to try to make a go of it in these MLMs, which is totally time consuming. Um, and again, in line with that, when I signed on with Mary Kay, they're like, oh, you know, you load up all this makeup and all the skin products in this suitcase and, you know, and you, you slough it all around the county and you have these home shows. And, and that's why I told my gals at the salon. I said, you're in a perfect environment because you don't have to have home parties. Your customers right. are coming to you 
every two weeks, every three weeks, every six weeks to get a service done. And all you have to do is just make it available. And so you don't have to do all of that extra hours of having home parties. And that's why it worked for us. So I get it, though. If you're just out there and you don't have a ready-made audience, you have to create your audience. Right. Yeah, and, and that's, my one, that's where the work comes in. <laughs> my one um, suggestion, never try to incorporate two MLMs together. I tried doing tastefully simple and pampered chef now when you hear those they go hand right. in hand but oh yeah yeah <laughs> i was trying to cook for they they would all come in and i would be in the kitchen and i would cook the food using tastefully simple food in hoping to sell both and all they did was eat <laughs> I get so, it. And you're putting and you're putting the money up front. And part exactly. of it, too. Um, and again, I, I hear this oftentimes when folks are going to a trade show and they say, oh, you need to set up and show your ML, you know, whatever your MLM it, that you're representing. And I said, you know what, that sounds good in theory. But when folks come in the door, just like with your example, when folks come in the door, they have X amount of dollars that they're prepared to spend. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to spend 50 bucks tonight, or I'm going to spend hundred bucks tonight. And so now your two products are in competition with each other for that 50 bucks or that hundred dollars. Yeah. So even if they do spend money, they're generally not going to spend it on both. They're going to pick one thing or two things that they kind of had in mind already. And that's what they're going to spend their money on. So I, I get that. And so, and so it's a lot of effort and cost on your part to try to make a go of it that. Was. And again, my stylist, their, their customers were coming to them. All they had to do was make that tastefully simple, uh, you know, available. See? Right. Right. And exactly. Because so the customers kind of already knew what they wanted because they'd been, they'd already been to your home party, Debbie, and they already decided what they wanted to buy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't so forget about, Park about Lane. that. <laughs> oh, you know, and I even sold jewelry, Park Lane. Park yes, Lane, yes. Sophia, you know? And there again, you're going, you're setting up parties. And if you did craft shows, you're setting up your jewelry, hoping nobody's going to five finger discount it. And you, know. and you have to pay for your booth space. Exactly. Yeah. And the time, oh my goodness, putting together, going, setting up, sitting, tearing down, mm -hmm. going home and putting away. I mean, you were talking about handling things with the grocery store. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. So you decided that all of that craziness wasn't for you. And so now you're moving on to plan D. <laughs> Can you imagine having to go plan D? No way. <laughs> Somebody, some people will say, I would have given up by that, you know, forget oh, it. Oh, no, we can never give up. So by then, no, your, we girls, your, your, your girls are finishing high school. Yes. Um, so tell us about that. What was next for you as a mom and a wife? Well, honestly, I was lost, very lost. And, well... I did something that no one ever saw it coming. Um, I decided that I had had enough confusion, dictatorship, controlling, and you say, what's next? Okay. So what I did was I secretly found a place to move to. I packed made arrangements for the movers, changed my address. <clears throat> and after 20, 28 years of marriage, I moved out. I separated. Oh, goodness, Debbie. <laughs> I was like, ah! that's you know, huge. It, it was interesting to say the least. And scary. But a lot, a lot of things occurred during the five to six months and what it came down to was this. I grew my spiritual love with, with God. I found peace. 
And I went to North Carolina for our oldest daughter's wedding, which everybody told me, don't go, don't go, blah, blah, blah. I went. And I don't know about some of you, but if you're going to some place and you just are like, butterflies are in your stomach as big as Mothra. And when I had peace, I was completely calm, no problem. I was good. And so when the weekend ended, um, uh, my husband and I did a lot of talking and um, discussing, you know, things and we got back together. And, and what's so nice is that um, uh, we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to get a fresh start because Lori got married in August. So, and, and uh, so we didn't have much time, uh, many months, but we moved to Charlotte and we actually renewed our, our wedding vows when after our 29th anniversary and, and here we are now um, at 47 years and I am forever grateful, I mean, for going, putting myself out there and sharing with my family, you know, what I wanted, what I was looking for. Of course, I still wasn't quite sure what I was looking for or going to get, but, but, you know. But, you know, Debbie, thinking about folks that are maybe listening to this later, because of your early years, that was probably a tough thing for you to do was to put your wants and needs out there in front of your family because you were kind of, how shall I say it, kind of trained through all of those early years that it's, that it's never about you. It's always about the dad that was abusive and the family kind of cowered down to that. And so, as I like to say, sometimes it's not what's taught, it's what's caught. And oh. that's definitely what was caught, you know, yeah. for you and your siblings. And so that was, that was a big step for you to come to that realization and put out there that this is what I need in this relationship. Yeah. So kudos to you and to, to <laughs> folks that are listening to this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It, um, and, and to just expand on the renewal of our vows we actually went to the place where my daughter had gotten, had her um, wedding and ready, wedding reception was on a riverboat on Lake Norman. Oh, so nice. She got married on the boat. Reception was there. So when we went back, we had the ship's captain marry us on land. And then we had um, a dinner for everyone on, on the riverboat and took a ride. It was awesome. It was so, it. you know, and people that additional people that were on there just gave us, you know, kudos for, you know, re redoing our vows and recommitting to, to our life together. And, and I see this is, I, this is more information I didn't know about you, Debbie. How fun. <laughs> well, and I give that, um, uh, uh, what do I want to say that that time for what went on to give us this um, solid marriage and um, and a family oh, you know yeah okay <laughs> I love it I love it so things are going good. Life is good. You've made some serious decisions. And now all of a sudden, um, gosh, COVID hits. You've got a dream, though, that you're trying to think through and bring into fruition. So what happens now? Well, <clears throat> it was during the COVID years year or years whatever the continuing <laughs> covid yes <laughs> <laughs> yes um i i had problems i mean who didn't during this time right right and and so what i did 
was this, this is where my story got exciting. I mean, all of a sudden, a daydream that I had back many years ago started doing reruns in my head. And so, I, our dream, you know, our okay, dreams so, have a way of, our dreams have a way of doing that, Debbie. <laughs> yes, <they do. laughs> but it's always the same. There's never anything different. It's always the same. And what's nice is that um, uh, just before COVID hit, I had found a church that I absolutely love going to. And um, uh, I started doing Bible studies with this one group of ladies. And, and it's actually called the Legacy Bible Study. So um, it, it has been the most rewarding uh, uh, study that I have ever been in. And um, Pam, who um, runs the Bible study, um, we go to her home every Saturday. And the, the classes are like six weeks long, but um, her and I just just hit it off. You know, um, she, she's become like a mom to me. And just before I had met her, um, she had lost her one and only daughter, only Aww. child to cancer. And she has one grandchild or one granddaughter. But um, her and I have hit it off so well that there are many times I call her my second mom because she teaches, she shares, she answers questions that I may have. And she's just, you know, when, when it's something for me, it's her and me, nothing else, no distractions. And for this, it's very important to me. And um, uh, I, I just got to keep going. I just have to keep going. So tell us about your keeping going. What is it that your dream is that you're now bringing to fruition for everyone? Well, what does 2022 hold for me? Um, new avenues, uh, new experiences, creating more memories. Um, and creating I, a legacy. Yes, I, I, I have a legacy to create. And if I wait any longer, who knows? <laughs> and so anyways, um, I have decided during this year, um, I've created a blog called Debbie's Organic Homesteading. I might as well put all this uh, gardening and, yes. and plants and vegetables <clears throat> to good use for not only for myself, but for others out there that are a little afraid or have questions. So I'm really excited about this. And, and this, this um, season, I have gathered so much information, so many videos and um, in developing this that I'm very anxious to um, get it out there. I, I got to get it out there and I'm not going to wait till someday because some days never come. And um, I get that. And I heard <laughs> that you are writing a book. Tell us about your book, Debbie. Well, um, it's one that, you know, I keep putting off and keep putting off. And I mentioned earlier that um, uh, I have a book that I'm writing and um, the title of the book is it started with a daydream from child abuse to entrepreneurship, because that's basically what I have done. Mm -hmm. And um, by doing this outline that I've done, it puts so much of my story at my fingertips to be able to go out and share this. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I've left out. So um, 
that, that we haven't talked about today. And um, so I want to build a curiosity um, to uh, come and read the book when I launch it. And, um, and it, I, this is going to really provide me with additional avenues through my life experiences that I can touch so many different lives. And Having your message is so important. It is so important. Thank you. It, I, feel, I feel closer to it now. Um, um, I want to just leave you with, uh, with these words. Um, today, tomorrow, and the future is all mine. I have found clarity to my purpose in life. I love the inner strength that I have now. It was lying so deep in my soul. It took baby steps. We always talk about baby steps. To locate, build, and bring out into the light for all to see. I want to be a light, a uh, uh, um, lighthouse for uh, people. I am on the path to become what God has intended me to be, growing in strength, confidence, and self-esteem is going to be my legacy that I leave for my grand grandchildren. So um, go out. I want you all to just go out, live your life, experience, open yourself up, create a life that's worth living, and create a love, legacy for those you love because who is going to talk about you after you're gone? And what are they going to say? So um, <laughs> I've given myself this uh, uh, title, which I actually created back when I was doing some uh, special training. And that is this, I am a confident, committed, successful, now I added this, 68-year-old woman, or year young woman, hear me roar. And this, the picture is of a lion roaring with these words on it. So um, uh, I, I have to tell you that I have uh, enjoyed this immensely, sharing. Um, back when you interviewed me, there was, there was so much I had to leave out that I felt the necessity to come clean. I, I, you know, I want people to understand where I came from and why I'm moving forward in this direction and to help them understand that they can have and create a life worth living. And uh, so thanks, Kathy, for uh, helping me with this. Sally, thank you for uh, being here with us so that uh, you could actually interject yourself into it. That's very much appreciated. And, and I hope that the women who listen to the recording here um, reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Let us know if we can help you, um, if you want to share your story, you don't even have to have a business if you don't want. Share your story. What is your future dreams? And um, uh, I want to grow uh, Fireside Chat with Debbie Marks next year to, to expand to wherever it's going to take us. Only God knows the answer to that. And we just have to be open uh, to go through the doors that uh, he opens for us. So um, thanks a lot. I appreciate this. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing. I mean, yes, and I Debbie, Debbie, yes, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. So for everyone that's listening, tune in every month to Fireside Chat with Debbie Marks. If you would like to be interviewed and share your story, you can connect with Debbie. Um, Debbie, if you put that in the chat, I will put it on the replay. Um, okay. 
And you can find the replays um, by contacting Debbie. She's going to put her, her contact information in the actual chat um, so that folks can see that once we uh, upload the recording. So Debbie, I appreciate you. Sally, I appreciate you. And we will see everyone next time. And again, Debbie's putting- One more that... note. Yep, go ahead. One more note. Please come back next month because we already have a very interesting speaker and you will be kind of intrigued as to the information she's gonna share with us about recycling. Perfect. It's amazing. Perfect. So, <laughs> Perfect. so, so we'll, yes, thank you so much. And we will see everyone next time. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, happy yes. Thanksgiving. Same to you all.